During the early days of the 20th century, the United States was still growing in fits and spurts. And in the shadow of World War I stood the Progressive Era. It gave birth to the conservationist. People who put the issue of conservation high on the national agenda. People such as Theodore Roosevelt, Gifford Pinchot, and this guy here. I founded the Sierra Club in 1892. And though Teddy and I were friends, we had very different views on conservation. Roosevelt wanted nature protected so it could work for the people, producing crops and that sort of thing. I just wanted it protected for its beauty. But Teddy did a great job protecting such American wonders as the Grand Canyon and Crater Lake. In regard to nature and conservation, we had our share of female heroes too, such as Harriet Lawrence, Hemingway, and her cousin Mina Hall. These two women had formed the National Audubon Society. Together with its members, they pushed the Migratory Bird Act into Congress in 1913. But following the end of World War II, as American industry was ramping up, the U.S. population was growing by leaps and bounds. Cities such as Los Angeles and New York were exploding in size. The country had changed in the short time since FDR was in office. As chair of the New York State Senate's Forest, Fish, and Game Committee, I introduced eight bills addressing conservation. But the prosperity following the end of the war gave way to one of the largest urban sprawls in this country's history. And so, the places where people live, work, shop, and recreate were far from one another to the extent that walking, transit use, and bicycling were impractical. So all of these activities generally required a car. Thusly, the American traffic jam becomes a thing. And it was throughout the 1950s that a prosperous urban development in the country was moving at breakneck speed. Planting trees and expanding wildlife refuges were great accomplishments for the conservation methods of FDR. But there had not yet been a connect of the movement to public health. A new ecological awareness needed to reach every mom and dad striving to protect their children's health. Nobody wanted to give their child cow's milk containing dangerous levels of strontium-90, or serve fish contaminated with toxic mercury. Even the beat generation of the late 1950s was starting to understand the importance of our connection to nature. This book here was about the duality in my life and ideals, examining my relationship with the outdoors and open spaces, and hiking and jazz clubs, and poetry and drunken parties. Like the 1960s were about to begin bringing some major consciousness about what was happening with the Big Blue Marble Baby. It was during this period, the 1960s, in which a convergence of different events, ideologies, and five very different groups of people throughout the country would come together. It would all culminate in creating a launch pad for the very first Earth Day event. So when one of the foremost best-selling books on consumerism, titled The Wastemakers by Vance Packard, is published in 1960, the nation learns of its overconsuming consequences. This book argues that people in the U.S. consume a lot more than they should and are harmed by their overemphasized consumption, especially quantity rather than quality, and so they're foregoing culture, prudence, and a proper concern for the future. I think it's ridiculous Packard blames these distorted values on the business community, especially on the marketers and advertisers who he accused of having beguiled the public into accepting false standards. But he's right. He is right. Actually, he's not that right enough. Starting in the late 1950s, Rachel Carson had focused her attention on environmental conservation especially environmental problems that she believed were caused by synthetic pesticides. And they were a problem, so I did a lot of research, and the result of all my research? So, in June of 1962, The New Yorker publishes excerpts from Carson's electrifying forthcoming book, titled... The Silent Spring? Everyone seems to be very excited about this Silent Spring book. Well, not everyone is excited. Uh-oh. Not the chemical companies making these synthetic pesticides. 
We're gonna need a really good PR company for this one. Very interesting. I think you've really struck a chord, Rachel. I think Miss Carson may have struck a chord. These are the first of many small waves being made in the literary community to bring the health of the environment to the American consciousness. On the political spectrum, many Democrats were looking for new causes during this new era of prosperity. And as the U.S. moved into the 60s, a man often referred to as the number one conservationist of the time rose up. During this time serving three consecutive terms as a senator, starting in 1963, this former governor of Wisconsin finally convinced a reluctant President John F. Kennedy to take action and nudge him to take a major first step in bringing the idea of the environment to the public sphere. I knew that Big Chemical would be coming after Miss Carson for her book. He wanted her defended from the onslaught of abuse, which surely was going to be thrown her way. The Silent Spring was published in book form on September 27, 1962. It documented the adverse environmental effects caused by the indiscriminate use of pesticides. The chemical industry has been spreading disinformation, and public officials have blindly accepted the industry's claims unquestioningly. And, of course, the chemical industry went ballistic. The National Agriculture Chemicals Association rushed its propaganda booklet Fact and Fancy into print. Miss Carson has her story. We have ours. Because of Miss Carson's book, the Department of Agriculture and the Public Health Service has launched a full-blown investigation into whether pesticides cause illnesses to humans. Uh-oh. We're going to need two really good PR companies for this one. I got Kennedy to use the Silent Spring to help push the Democratic Advisory Council's agenda to combat pollution. We connected old-style conservation to the new-style environmentalism that called for protection of Earth, air, and water. And all creatures dwelling therein. The momentum of the book, along with Senator Gaylord Nelson and the Secretary of the Interior, Stuart Udall, helped launch a special panel of the President's Science Advisory Committee. I said launch a special panel of the President's Science Advisory Committee. They might as well have called the panel the Rachel Carson Wins Panel. No one likes a sore winner, Rachel. Gaylord Nelson would continue to come back around throughout the decade and be a driving force behind the first major event for environmentalism and conservationism. It was also during the 1960s that American families were finding more and more time for vacations. Can we move now? Yeah, this pose is killing me. And the great institution of camping was beyond enjoyed like never before. As outdoor recreation grew, the hotels and tourism destination hated this. I hate this. The urban sprawl of the 1950s had brought families out of the cities and much closer to nature. And as the downtown areas of cities had become the man's domain, the suburban areas were becoming the woman's domain. Thusly, we the American housewives of the GI generation were quickly forming into groups. We needed to discuss why an increasing number of park areas were getting bulldozed. We were concerned with the why and the how the environment was affecting our children. Smog? Pesticides? Polluted water? None of us wanted our children near any of that. So we started organizing. It ain't called Mother Earth for nothing. Little did we know at the time, we were forming a movement. A movement which would have a far-reaching impact on conservationists and the American hunter. The conversation was just heating up. We traveled together, passengers on a little spaceship, dependent on its vulnerable reserves of air and soil, all committed for our safety to its security and peace preserved from annihilation only by the care, the work, and I will say, the love we give our fragile craft. We cannot maintain it, half fortunate, half miserable, half confident, half despairing, half slave to the ancient enemies of man, half free in a liberation of resources undreamed of until this day. No craft, no crew can travel safely with such vast contradictions. On their resolution depends the survival of us all. 
This very impassioned speech gave birth to another book from another female author. It would also help bring more attention to the environmental cause. So, the following year in 1966, Barbara Ward published Spaceship Earth. I gotta tell you, I love this book. It's some weird, wild stuff. And I love the title, Barbara. Some people would even say I coined the phrase. <laughs> I used phrases like inner limits and outer limits to refer to the inner limits of the human right to an adequate standard of living and the outer limits of what the Earth can sustain. Myself and René Dubois, co-authors of Only One Earth, have been described as the parents of a concept which did not know its own name at first. And I was seen by some as a pioneer of sustainable development. The women's groups and a few forward-thinking Democrats were now part of this movement. Meanwhile, the scientists were starting to report the changes happening to Mother Earth. Barry Commoner was a professor of plant physiology for 34 years. He was well known for his opposition to nuclear weapons testing in the 1950s. I'm still referred to as the Paul Revere of ecology. I established Nuclear Information, a mimeograph newsletter published in my office. This would later become Environment Magazine. I went on to write several books about the negative ecological effects of atmospheric, aka above-ground nuclear testing. As we approached the 70s, my protests against nuclear energy were starting to pick up, both speed and notoriety. But another big influence on the environment was going to come from a group of professors from the University of California at Berkeley and Stanford University. The Sierra Club has been operating out of San Francisco, California since 1892. Their ranks had risen after many people came home at the conclusion of World War II. And one such member was David Brower. After World War II, Brower returned to his job with the University of California Press and began editing the Sierra Club Bulletin in 1946. Our mission had been to explore, enjoy, and protect the wild places of the Earth. To practice and promote the responsible use of the Earth's ecosystems and resources. To educate and enlist humanity to protect and restore the quality of the natural and human environment. And to use all lawful means to carry out these objectives. The government saw us as a major pain in the ass. After a few early environmental fights in the 20th century, some won, some lost. The Sierra Club really started to become a household name at the beginning of the 1960s during a few specific events. In 1960, they launched the exhibit format book series with This is the American Earth. And in 1962, In Wilderness is the Preservation of the World with photos by Elliot Porter. 50,000 copies were sold in the first four years. And by 1960, sales exceeded 10 million. The Sierra Club's crusade of the 1960s was the effort to stop the Bureau of Reclamation from building two dams that would flood portions of the Grand Canyon. The ads generated a storm of protest to the Congress, prompting the Internal Revenue Service to announce it was suspending the club's 501 status pending an investigation. Nothing to see here. And let me say this, we're not plotting against the Sierra Club, as far as you know. Despite their troubles, membership climbed sharply. However, the club's support for clean, low-cost nuclear power over new dams and dirty fossil fuel energy upset David Brower. Cheap energy causes population growth. And so, Brower and the Sierra Club parted ways. Friends of the Earth was founded in 1969 by David Brower, Donald Eichen, and Gary Sushi. Together, they pioneered aggressively environmental campaign strategies. Playing dirty is fine. If you have noble goals in mind. During the 1950s into the 1960s, inland bodies of water in North America and Europe experienced dangerous transformation. Nutrients were dumped into the lakes, causing chain reactions which severely impacted lake environments. The excessive increase to inland waters through human activity 
known as cultural eutrophication, emerged as a dominant problem. For far too many years prior, the iron ore from the Lake Superior region was shipped to various centers on the shores of Lake Erie, including Cleveland and Detroit. A system left without checks and balances for far too long was rearing its head. Luckily, in the 1960s, one woman helped to stop this mess. Marion Stoddard's campaign, including forming an activist group, eventually became the Nashua River Watershed Association. It's widely credited with coaxing Beacon Hill to adopt the 1966 Massachusetts Clean Water Act. It was the first in the United States and a blueprint for the federal reforms coming in the early 1970s. Including the Clean Water Act and the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency. Until that time, most Americans accepted industrial runoff that polluted U.S. waterways since colonial times. Actually, in my time, if people were polluting the river, we'd simply run them out of the village and banish them for life. Considering how much tyranny of the commons takes place today, that may not be a bad idea. Chemical-laden rivers catching fire and raw sewage were often tolerated as necessary evils associated with good manufacturing jobs. Let me know if you need my musket to ward off polluters. In January of 1967, the National Wildlife Federation first published the magazine known as Ranger Rick's Nature Magazine. The children's nature magazine offered feature articles and activities for children. We want to instill a passion in kids for nature and promote activity outdoors. The magazine uses an environmentally friendly processed paper, which is composed of consumer waste and is absent of chlorine. Vegetable oils largely make up the magazine's actual ink. Just like the one you're holding. And since we're all for waste not, want not, this comic is made from 100% recycled paper. Because why not? Meanwhile, back over at the Sierra Club. In 1968, at the suggestion of David Brower, Stanford University professor Paul R. Ehrlich, and his wife, Ann Ehrlich, who was uncredited, published The Population Bomb. This book predicts worldwide famine in the 1970s and 1980s due to overpopulation, as well as other major societal upheavals and advocates radical action to limit population growth. Ridiculous. These fears of a population explosion were widespread in the 1950s. This book and its author have simply ushered the idea to an even wider audience with a clearly alarmist tone. Okay, so maybe we didn't get it spot on. But it alerted people to the importance of environmental issues and widened the debate on the human future. And the book sold over two million copies, raised awareness of population and environmental issues, and influenced 1960s and 70s public policy. So there. And besides, what have you done to help lately? Also, in 1968, one of the strongest images to help bolster this new movement came from a most unlikely source, an Apollo 8 astronaut. Whoa, that is just amazing. The influence of William Anders' picture, Earthrise, taken 240,000 miles away from the planet, is quite difficult to overstate. For the first time, people were able to see the Earth in its entirety. Whoa, that is just amazing. It is the most influential environmental photograph ever taken. Whoa. It is one of the most famous photographs ever taken. It was symbolic of a powerful new ideology of the United States that was growing. It showed the fragility of the planet and that humanity was destined to destroy it unless preventative steps were taken. An emotional component had now been given to the face of environmentalism. And it would soon become even more powerful as in 1969, one of the first major environmental disasters took place. It became the proverbial last straw to break the camel's back. And it happened right down there. Somewhere off the Southern California coast, 
Emergency! Emergency! We gotta shut this down now! The Santa Barbara oil spill on January 28, 1969 spewed an estimated 3 million gallons of crude oil into the ocean. It created an oil slick 35 miles long along the entire California coast and killed thousands of birds, fish, and sea mammals. Bummer, man. Major bummer. The blowout was caused by inadequate safety precautions taken by Unical, which was known then as Union Oil. The company received a waiver from the U.S. Geological Survey that allowed it to build a protective casing around the drilling hole that was 61 feet short of the federal minimum requirements at the time. The explosion was so powerful, it cracked the seafloor in five places, and crude oil spewed out of the rupture at a rate of 1,000 gallons an hour for a month before it could be slowed. The Santa Barbara oil spill had suddenly put the environment on the radar of a large Republican community in California. And following the disaster, the region became a flashpoint for founding a new environmental movement. Basically, the threat of poisoning the most valuable real estate in the country spawned a flurry of citizen-led environmental groups, and it majorly set off advocacy for a slew of new laws and regulations. Henry, Henry, it's emergency time again. The act required environmental impact reports, and the next year, the California Environmental Quality Act was adopted. America had been riding on a highway for a long time. And all of a sudden, this oil spill opened people's eyes as to what our lifestyles were creating. Right on, man. And by the way, dudes, the liberal environmental student activist was nowhere to be found through the 1960s. Yes, thank goodness. I had enough problems. That's true. Because instead of conservationism, the majority of an activist focus rested on poverty, civil rights, feminism, and the Vietnam War. These were not the same set of values that led 1960s activists to embrace environmentalism at the end of the decade. The student movement's mostly humanistic commitment to social justice prevented it, for most of the 1960s, from treating environmentalism as a serious concern. The Democrats, the scientists, the conservationists, the suburban housewife groups, they were already on that eco-wave. But us, the American youth, we were the last people to depart. Woohoo! I caught a wave! The important books, political campaigns, grassroots organizations of middle-aged suburban housewives, and the few catastrophic environmental events took a beat in late 1969 to start making its way into the student body of the American university system. Only after 1969 did the environmental movement's growing radicalism open the door for their sudden turn to ecological issues. But they all still needed a common language to unite their perspectives on how the United States would begin to tackle the tough issues laden states would begin to tackle. Re-enter Gaylord Nelson. Since elected to the United States Senate in 1962, I spend seven years trying unsuccessfully to draw the attention of lawmakers to my environmental agenda. However, beyond Capitol Hill, Americans increasingly shared my concerns. The percentage of citizens who cited cleaning up air and water as one of their top three political priorities rose from 17% in 1965 to 53% in 1970. Added to the rising fears about smog, pesticides, and water pollution were the dual headline grabbers of 1969, the Santa Barbara oil spill and a river so polluted it actually burned, Cleveland's Cuyahoga River. Then the idea struck me. If we could tap into the environmental concerns of the general public and infuse the student anti-war energy into the environmental cause, maybe we could generate a demonstration that would force the issue onto the national political agenda. I announced my intentions at a speech in Seattle on September 20th, 1969, several major media outlets immediately broadcast the idea to national audiences. I aim to unite these efforts 
and then extend them beyond the college campus. As the idea caught on, I set up Environmental Teach-In, Inc. to handle the flood of queries from excited citizens. Inclusivity was, for me, the key to a national day on the environment. I insisted that the national office would not try to shape a uniform national protest. Grassroots participation in organization was extremely important to me. This was to be a day for people to act locally. It was the time for old-fashioned political action. I established a steering committee of scientists, academics, environmentalists, and students, and tapped California Republican Congressman Paul McCloskey as co-chair. Nelson's decision to leave Earth Day to the grassroots proved genius. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, Nelson was a genius, except for naming this thing, okay? Calling it a teach-in was a serious turnoff, okay? Julian Koenig called me to volunteer. I asked him what he thought we should call it. Koenig said, give me a few days, and then he came back with a few different names. But he made it very clear. We'd be idiots if we didn't use Earth Day. I mean, this guy Julian was the hottest creative on Madison Avenue. The next evening, my staff and I placed the full-page ad in the Sunday New York Times. Thanks to, uh, Dan Lufkin, a cool Wall Streeter who financed a lot of our Earth Day operations. And it worked perfect. And it exceeded wildest expectations. Over 10,000 elementary and high schools, 1,500 colleges, and over 1,000 communities. All took action on April 22nd, 1970. The people made their voices heard. Though the students lent the day a unique spirit, it did not draw out only the young. The slogan, Give Earth a Chance, was first popularized back in 1969 by the Environmental Action for Survival Committee. Housed at the University of Michigan, they sold buttons on Earth Day with the slogan resembling the Give Peace a Chance slogan. Would you like a Give Earth a Chance button? My sister, it's Give Peace a Chance. No, my young man, that button is right. And sit up straight and stay in school and don't do drugs. Nelson remained modest about his own contribution, but was extremely proud of the nation's response. Earth Day worked because of the spontaneous response at the grassroots level. We had neither the time nor resources to organize the 20 million demonstrators from thousands of schools and local communities who participated. That was the amazing thing about Earth Day. It organized itself. Henry, Henry, where are you going? In Washington, at least, environmental politics did, for a time, become the obsession of both parties. The midterm election of 1970 spelled defeat for politicians linked to dirty industries. So President Nixon and many people in Congress rushed to lend their support to the National Environmental Protection Act. We need to get on board with this, Henry. Big changes are coming soon. You're telling me, Mr. President. As well as the Endangered Species Act and rigid amendments to the Clean Air and Clean Water Acts. Despite the achievements, many remain suspicious that the new environmental politics and national discourse served to distract from the struggles against militarism, racism, and poverty. He's talking about us, man. We didn't think it warranted the attention as all the other stuff going on. But that Gaylord dude, he knew, like, the future, man, and where this could all end up. Us too. We knew. You want a button now? In the Senate, Nelson worked to break through these perceived divisions between the era's major crises. He repeatedly called for elimination of the federal funds dedicated to the Vietnam War, defense technology, and the space program. This was money that Nelson wanted more effectively spent on toxic cleanup and green jobs. He insisted in the week before the first Earth Day. Make no mistake, any national policy on the environment that is worth its name must mean attacking the problem of our cities and the poor as much as it means providing national parks and scenic rivers. 
Nelson's aim with the first Earth Day was to light a fire for the environment in Washington. Honestly, I saw no need to replicate Earth Day, but Earth Day, born in rural towns and big cities across the country in 1970, has remained a way to raise awareness of local environmental issues each year. When the first Earth Day was celebrated, thousands joined folk singers Pete Seeger and Phil Oakes when they sang All we are saying is give us a chance. No longer would conservation be a cult of bird watchers, fair chase hunters, and the outdoor recreationalist. Instead, it was here on this very day, the rise of consciousness and the widespread scope of the environmental movement and what was happening started to finally take root. In not only the American university system, but in the larger public sphere. But where would it go from here? To be continued.